the best of the week on Relevant Radio. Maybe you've heard a lot about it over the last eight months or so. It's the CAS report. It came out back in March. So I guess that's six months ago. And the CAS report was produced in the UK. And it really took the UK by storm. There's actually drama. The UK and doctors there have been in outrage as the main bodies of physicians there in the UK have actually been represented for by head leadership saying, no, actually, we're going to support this with thousands opposing and hundreds leaving. And yet what's continuing to happen in the UK is significant because what happened was the UK ended up asking Dr. Hillary Cass to conduct research that spanned the time of four years. It was a four-year-long study using international data. It was commissioned by the National Health Services of England, and it was brought up because there were ongoing scandals occurring in the British gender, so-called gender clinics, that were concerning from a medical perspective, and people, especially minors, weren't faring well. Now, what happened in what's known as the CAS review is it was a comprehensive, thorough, and undebatable review. This is what's so challenging about it. It's undebatable because the review takes current research and international standards. It takes extensive review of interviews from kids who are gender confused, along with adults, family members, many who have detransitioned, which we're seeing a lot of 19 and 20 something year olds here in the US who have detransitioned. We've interviewed many of them and we will link in the show notes to the testimonies of these young voices such as Abel Garcia, who detransitioned after the medical community transitioned him into being a female. You have Chloe Cole, who also was transitioned as a young girl and changed her mind when she learned about biology and learned about the fact that you can nurse a child and that she would likely never be able to because of her hysterectomy. It's people such as them who are interviewed along with doctors, activists, again, and those gender confused kids who are struggling. And the bottom line is what came out of that report was a 366 page report known as the CAS review with undeniable evidence showing that there's no benefit to children to minors who are being transitioned. And so to dive into that report and to give you that know-how and know what of the CAS report, joining me today is Dr. Teresa Farnan. Dr. Teresa Farnan is an author and moral philosopher. She comes to us from the Person and Identity Project that's on the front line bringing sound science and medical data to the conversation as Catholics about gender. Dr. Farnan, welcome back to Trending. Hey, I'm so delighted to be here. And that was a great summary, by the way, of the state of state of the play here. That was excellent. Well, there's so much to be discussed in the actual cast review. And I think a lot of people, Dr. Farn, don't understand how significant it is because it's really undebatable on an international level. And we have friends who are working as counselors and therapists internationally right now from the U.S. who are engaged in the international conversation. And they say that's what's so startling about the United States, Dr. Farnan, is that other countries are ditching gender transition for minors, yet the U.S. is out of date with both medical and psychological data today. So I would love it if you would start to dive into some of the key findings in the CAS review. Sure. Just um, by way of background, just to kind of set the stage for your listeners, Keep in mind that the UK has socialized medicine. And while we can see that at times socialized medicine has resulted in some really horrific things. So, for instance, the um, euthanasia of Charlie Mm -hmm. Gard, for example, Mm -hmm. and some of the other kids who are very, very deathly ill and the Liverpool pathway for dying, which was like basically a euthanasia protocol that was universally applied. One of the features I think that's playing to our favor in this is that because the UK has socialized medicine, they are following people from cradle to grave, right? So they do not, Mm -hmm. in our healthcare system, we have a patchwork of healthcare. And so people drop in and drop out. I'm in the, I'm in Pennsylvania in the city of Pittsburgh. We have two major healthcare systems, UPMC and Allegheny General, and then a whole host of other insurers. Aetna, for example, comes to mind. And what you'll see is you'll see as people change insurances, they have to change their physicians. 
-hmm. So it's really, really hard to have any kind of serious follow-up. So the shortfall of almost all of the studies in the United States is that the average time for follow-up of these kids who are going through these treatments is less than three years. And so what they were able to do in the UK was they were able to follow these kids and follow them for years, right? And because of that, they were able to pick up the signals were missing, right? And the signals that were missing mm -hmm. is that here are these kids, they're reporting subjective satisfaction, but clinically, they're not doing any better. And in many cases, they were doing worse. And that's the big thing to know, because the storyline has been, there's this special classification of trans kids. And so in order to keep them from committing suicide, we need to put them through these really horrific barbaric treatments. And then that way we will save their lives. But what the reality is, is that these kids were not doing well. You can't take a child and put them on wrong sex hormones or put them on puberty blockers and delay their not just their sexual maturation, but their social maturity, right? Because puberty is a really important time for kids to, to develop and grow and mature and everything else. And so, you know, if you put kids into these experimental pathways, they not only continue to struggle, they're going to do worse. And that was the signal they were picking up in the UK. And it was all kicked off by a detransitioner named Cara Bell, who sued the UK after her double mastectomy. And her point was, she said, I came to you and I had experienced so much trauma in my life. I was really struggling with psychological issues. And instead of giving me psychological help and support, you put me onto this pathway of medicalization and assured me that would solve all my problems. And now mm -hmm. I've got, you know, a scarred chest, a broken voice, and my problems haven't gone away. But now I'm a woman in my 20s and strong enough to say this was a medical scandal and I was a vulnerable child and no one should have treated me like this. Really significant what you just shared because she was able to see in her 20s, more so closer to where the brain's developing. It's more reasonable. She has, in hindsight, she's understanding her desires, her body. She's coming out, it sounds like, out of some of these psychological traumas that she had. And now she's going, I was given a medical intervention for a psychological crisis. Yes. And this young woman, she was so brave. I mean, it really was, was astonishing. But what the upshot of this as a result of her lawsuit, she actually lost in court. But the outcry from the public when they saw this brave young woman coming forward caused the UK to launch on another internal investigation. And at the same time, there's another book by a journalist named Hannah Barnes, who wrote a book called A Time to Think. And she details how the Tavistock is imploding. And so what you begin to see is you begin to see the UK suddenly realizing it's got to address this. And so what they did was they launched, they closed the Tavistock down after the the cast review came out what's findings, tapestock again for those who don't know yes the tavistock clinic was tavistock. the centralized clinic in the uk where all of the kids would be sent for their gender transition so again because it was socialized medicine you have this feature where all of these kids are being aggregated into one system of clinics mm -hmm. and so so because of that she was able, she had all of these records, she's pulling it all. And so let me get to the important point, which is the findings, right? And so the findings were that there's no evidence that this medical protocol is saving lives. There's no evidence that it's helping kids. It's been a politicized debate. There is no rationale for early puberty suppression and plenty of red flags that make us think this would be harmful for kids. She raised the red flag also on the use of either masculinizing or feminizing hormones in those who were under the age of 18 and even those who were, you know, adults and again said, we don't have the long-term follow-up data to be able to establish that young people can safely use these. And we certainly don't know what happens when you take a child in the midst of puberty and put them on the wrong hormones. And then she also, this was fascinating, they also highlight that social transition, which is presented in the United States as a benign process, you know, a period of exploration, she referred to it as a psychosocial intervention. 
So a psychosocial intervention is a behavioral intervention, a protocol, if you will, that you start a child on to improve some feature of their mental health, right? So if you have a child who has, you know, is struggling with OCD, for example, you might have behavioral interventions, you know, or a child who's got phobias, they would probably expose them little by little to the source of their fears to help them overcome it. Well, a social transition is a psychosocial intervention. So you take this child who's feeling distress and instead of helping them to resolve their anxiety, you say to this child, you're right, you are born in the wrong body, let's try seeing how it works to live as the opposite sex, or to live as someone who's non-binary. And so you encourage this child to make a public declaration, but what they found in these clinics was as these young people sort of publicly embarked on these gender transitions, it became very, very difficult for them to back out of it. And it also indicated that it, they also had evidence that these kids were lagging behind their peers. So if you can imagine in a group of, you know, say you have a group of sixth graders, one of whom goes on to puberty blockers and all the rest go through puberty, that one on puberty blockers is still going to be like a little kid. He's going to be like the 11 year old. And meanwhile, mm -hmm. everybody else, you know, the difference between the age of 14 and the age of 11 it's like the Grand Canyon. Right. So when you say behind, because a lot of the kids, at least here in the U.S., are being transitioned with the puberty blockers around 13, 14, very common, mm -hmm. especially in California. Mm -hmm. When you say they're lagging behind, are you, do you mean exclusively uh, developmentally in terms of puberty? Or are you talking about psychologically and even in terms of like uh, skills, tactile things? Everything, everything, because puberty is even important for building your IQ. There's one mm -hmm. single study, so you have to be careful because a case study is not the same as a systematic review. But there was one systematic, one case study coming out of the country in South America where they followed a young girl and put her on puberty blockers and her IQ dropped. Mm -hmm. Like nobody's even talking about that. And why would that be? Because puberty compared to her peers she plateaued and meanwhile when they measure iq they measure based on age right so here suddenly she's still frozen in this like 12 year old 13 year old state and meanwhile everybody else is 15 16. it's a world mm -hmm. of difference so mm -hmm. for all of these reasons the cast review also highlighted that and the upshot was to discontinue the use of puberty blockers in for anyone who was a minor, and then urging caution with all of these other aspects of gender mm -hmm. transition. And it's been a real gift for us because for the first time, it's a systematic review that we can point to where we can say like, you know, your studies, here are the flaws in your studies, but look at this, this is, this is if you will, it's, a, it's the gold standard. It's a systematic mm -hmm. review, it's a meta-analysis, and we can see that this is long term and in the short term really harmful for the kids it claims to help. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, something all, different things always kind of ping for me when I'm hearing the different research coming out on the gender transition, how negatively impactful it is for these kids who are receiving both the puberty blockers, so they're not going through a normal puberty, and then second, who are receiving cross-sex hormones because they're receiving very synthetic form of these cross-sex hormones and what we know from a lot of the data on the impact of for example hormonal birth control for women that when young girls in their adolescent years into their 20s take hormonal birth control that it's actually damaging the brain's ability to cope with stress and what mm -hmm. happens is it's permanently damaging the ability to cope with stress so down the road maybe you're in your 30s but you took during those adolescent developmental years hormonal birth control what we've learned now is that those girls might be able to find like tactile skills, like maybe I'm stressed, so I sit and take handwritten notes instead of typing on a computer. I I'm feeling overwhelmed, maybe I need to go and sit and f put my feet up. I don't know, just those, those things that are physically helpful to help you cope with stress. But uh, psychologically, what we've learned is the brain cannot adapt to stress. And so if that's happening for the girls who are put on birth control during the years when their brains and bodies are developing and going through puberty, it has to be happening and probably all the more so because puberty has been thwarted for the same kids who are being put through these gender transitions with chemical transition. The issue is so important. I would say go to study on the issue of gender. And if you'd like to learn more about it, I'm posting a link 
on social media. It's a 366 pages. It was commissioned by the National Health Research in England. It had a four-year-long study using international data along with additional interviews. They were extensive with gender-confused children, adults, family members, doctors, and detransitioners. And it came to a very clear conclusion that there's no benefit to a child who is socially and medically, surgically transitioned. And it's significant because it shows what has led ultimately to additional countries over the last year ending any transition for minors who have sought it out. And the United States needs to catch up with international data on this. And uh, this resource is very helpful for you to learn more. So I'm posting on social media and in the show notes about the cast review. My guest today is Dr. Teresa Farnan. She is an author and moral philosopher. She comes to us from personandidentity.com. They are on the cutting edge of bringing scientific and sociological data medical data on the issue of gender with a Catholic perspective upholding the truth of the human person. Like what you just heard? Share it with your family and friends. And thanks for listening.